In this video, we'll consider the question, what is environmental sociology? And when we take a look at the field, what we see is that the field starts from a view that what we call environmental problems are usually caused by humans. They're human-induced. Or if you like the term anthropogenic, which is another, another way of referring to a human-induced uh, environmental problem. And the field of environmental sociology seeks to explain how these problems are defined. How do, how do people uh, maybe look at these things in the media, through science, uh, through everyday conversation? How are those problems understood? How do people think of them in terms of their, their starting points and uh, their impacts? And then how do people act upon those problems? Uh, do we come up with policies? Do we come up with solutions? Or do we throw our hands up in the air and say, well, it's too big, I can't do anything about it? Or do we say, well, I just don't choose to believe it's real? These are all types of responses that people have had to human-caused environmental problems. And there's two basic approaches environmental, in environmental sociology. Uh, the realist approach uh, is looking primarily at the material world. So here we're looking at directly those environmental problems uh, that are affecting people and which people are also causing. So the material, uh, the material world implies that there's some kind of objective independent uh, reality that we're trying to study and understand. The other side of the coin is the constructionists, and the constructionists aren't so much concerned directly with environmental problems as much as indirectly uh, with regard to how people define those problems and uh, choose to react to them. So we study how we think and form ideas about the material world using our social imagination. And of course that includes all of its many problems. And the ideal uh, and the ideal way of looking at things, problems are constructed subjectively. So we have sort of this objective materialist view, which looks directly at environmental problems, and then we have this constructionist subjective view, which looks more at the social understanding and imagination of those problems. So next we'll look at some key themes that define the field of environmental sociology. And one of those has to do with the relationship between individuals and social structure, uh, both in terms of understanding the causes of environmental problems and also in terms of understanding solutions. And on one hand, humans have agency. Uh, that is, we have the ability to make choices, to act in ways that we want to act. Uh, you know, if I, if I decide to stretch my arms out, then I'm going to stretch my arms out. And nothing can stop me except maybe a really strong wind or maybe a really low ceiling or something like that. And those would be structural uh, constraints. Uh, so human agency, as much as we like to think we have perfect uh, freedom to choose to act the way we want, uh, human agency is oft oftentimes and almost always constrained by some kind of social structural rule, policy, uh, something built into the structure itself, technology maybe, that's going to limit our choices and our human agency. And structure, you know, it's a, it's kind of a metaphor in some ways when we're talking about a social structure. It's really just referring to the way that society is arranged. And, uh, of course, that's going to influence our choices. And to a large degree, that just comes down to different sets of rules. Uh, so, for example, uh, when we're thinking about environmental impacts and these kinds of things, one of the goals is to drive less. And of course, on one hand, driving a car is an individual choice. People can decide to live their life without a car. On the other hand, communities that lack public transportation, uh, such as a bus system or subway or something along those lines, are very hard to navigate if they're, at least if they're pretty large communities, in the absence of a vehicle. So uh, we may have a choice to go without a car but if we live in a community that doesn't provide a good alternative, then that sacrifice becomes less realistic. And we're sort of forced by the structural constraints to, well, at least we're strongly influenced to buy the car. And uh, we see, in fact, very commonly in rural areas, this is something that people often reluctantly have to do. And in fact, some people have to commute for quite some distance just to work a minimum wage job and, and to do that they have to maintain a car and anybody who owns a car knows that that can be a significant burden on your on your budget and if you're working a minimum wage job 
Uh, it's much easier if you don't have to support a car, uh, but you don't really have a choice if you live in some remote kind of rural place. So the upshot is you know, driving's an individual choice, but the structural constraints can make the the choice to go without a car very difficult. So another theme is environmental justice, and this has to do with who gets the environmental goods or bads or benefits and costs, who has the uh, privilege of living near the desirable stuff, and who has the unfortunate uh, circumstance of living near the undesirable stuff, and even the toxic stuff. So that comes down to social organization. And social organization, the way we choose to organize our society, is of course highly stratified. And uh, that's something that has been observed just as endemic in, uh, within our social structure. And a number of studies have found a correlation between the race, uh, the racial demographics of a community, as well as class demographics in relation to toxic waste storage and dumping locations. And uh, what we find is racial and ethnic minorities, as well as those lower on the social class ladder, are more likely to live near some kind of toxic waste. And the other side of that is a racial majority group, the uh, white people in the United States, and those from a more middle or upper, upper class background are more likely to enjoy a clean, safe environment. So in some ways, environmental justice views environmental quality as yet another privilege that those without power uh, do not have access to. So ultimately, who you are is going to influence how you experience the environment, and uh, of course, those experiences are going to be very different. Another theme of environmental sociology is practical application. It is true that environmental sociology is a social scientific field, and as such, it's largely interested in doing research, but there are few who are involved with environmental research that don't also want to see some kind of improvement. Right? some kind of uh, follow-up, somebody making use of that research to either write a new policy or create a new program of some kind that could possibly lead to some improvements. So with practical application, the framing of environmental problems should not represent only the dominant narrative. And many times what we call common sense, which is often the dominant narrative, gets it wrong, and we have to be careful about those times. And uh, that's something that science in general can help us sort of penetrate through and, and, and raise attention about uh, real problems that are going on. And the last theme we'll think about for the field is environment of environmental sociology is the multi-level nature of the field. Uh, there are those who study the global level in environmental sociology, looking at entire countries and multinational corporations, and they tend to focus on different types of exploitation and issues of governance and national sovereignty as they pertain to the environments. Uh, and of course, uh, international relations are a big part of that. At the national level, environmental sociologists study production, consumption, as well as culture, uh, looking at theories such as the treadmill of production and ecological modernization theory, for instance. At the institutional level, Environmental sociologists look at all the different social institutions and the way that uh, they are related to environmental outcomes and also in terms of how they're related to uh, the social construction of environmental problems. All right, so, of course, our family is going to play a part there, our education, our religious upbringing, uh, the place where we work is going to have a lot to do with how we think about environmental issues, and the military, uh, political structure, Economics at the subnational level are all going to be relevant. And at the individual level, environmental sociologists tend to study things like individual attitudes, values, and behaviors, uh, which are, of course, the subject matter of public opinion research. Next, since environmental sociology is a social science, I think it's important to take a look at what that means. And this is the general process of social science, where you kind of start off with a, a topic of some kind. Uh, in this case, it would be an environmental problem. Uh, and then when we do research, we tend to do literature reviews where we look at other studies on that topic or problem. When we're done with that, we see what kind of remaining research questions there are, and then we design our own study. And that means we collect data, we analyze the data, 
and we draw conclusions, and usually those conclusions will evaluate those research questions that we formulated after having read the literature. So environmental sociology, uh, as a social science, is theory-driven. That means that we try to use uh, well-developed explanations that not don't just apply to one environmental problem, that, that apply to several or many, if not all, environmental problems. And there are three basic families here. Uh, the demographic theories that tend to focus on population first and foremost, but also look at technology and geography. Then there's the conflict theories, which tend to focus heavily on the political and economic processes in society. And then there's the cultural or constructionist theories that focus on the beliefs, values, and norms, uh, which really speak more to the idealist side of things in terms of uh, not so much environmental problems, but the way people think about, define, and respond to those environmental problems. So it's a scientific study of the human causes and consequences of environmental problems. Again, those are the realists, just to kind of revisit this uh, distinction here between realists and idealists. And the idealists look at the definition. How do we define the problem? How do we define its causes? And then how do we imagine uh, we could respond to that problem? Uh, maybe that's do nothing. Maybe it's to come up with a new law. Right, but the human response is going to dictate the type of response of uh, definition. So the practical approach of environmental sociology, again, uh, remember that even though it's a social scientific field, the goal is usually to make some kind of improvement, and that can happen at any of the levels we were talking about. Uh, maybe at the international level, that means developing global treaties and agreements. At the national level, new laws and policies. At the institutional level, maybe that leads to new rules and regulations. And at the individual level, maybe that leads to new types of behaviors, attitudes, or values. And that is essentially uh, just a broad overview of the field of environmental sociology. Thank you.